Let me begin by asking you, how do you apply or squeeze your tube of toothpaste? Answer in the comments. Now you may laugh, but the way a person squeezes or applies their tube of toothpaste is a lot about the person. A psychologist tell us that the person who squeezes their tube from the bottom is a very tidy and thrifty person that doesn't like waste. However, they can be a bit of a perfectionist, but they are hardworking and can be fully relied upon a hundred percent. In contrast, the person who squeezes their tube from the middle are not always the most tidiest of people. Yes, they are very realistic, but they are always in a rush. However, if they were ever faced with a challenge, then they rise to the occasion with great resolve. Then we have the person who squeezes their tube from the top. And these guys can be pretty stubborn. However, there are times when their stubbornness can work to their favour as they are always able to get things done and achieve their goals. And then finally, we have the person who squeezes their tube from just anywhere. And these guys see the world differently. And punctuality and tidiness may not be their strong points. However, they are very artistic and creative and can see um, beauty in pretty much anything. And so again, let me ask, how do you squeeze your tube of toothpaste? Answer in the comments. Now, toothpaste application can potentially become a point of contention if not applied correctly, especially within families and particularly within marriages. Now, thankfully, Becky and I are pretty much on the same page when it comes to squeezing our tube. And that's the wonderful thing about marriage, isn't it? That though we are two different people, yet within the framework of love and commitment, we are able to make it work for our good and for his glory. Because after all, marriage is a concept that is based upon the Godhead and designed by the creator himself. And so having said that and following on from last time, I've entitled this morning's message as simply Imago Day in his image part two. If you have your Bibles with you, then please come with me to the book of Genesis. And we're going to read today from chapter 2 and verse 7 and then verses 18 to 24. And it says this. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. Verse 18. Then the Lord said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, last time. We saw a number of wonderful foundational truths from the creation account. 
How Genesis 1 is riddled with the number 7, the Jewish number of perfection and completion. That there were seven days, seven let there be statements in one form or another. And seven times where the Lord says either implicitly or explicitly, it was good. And then we noted that on the seventh time, the wording changed somewhat to say it was very good because we, mankind, were made. And when we were, we were set apart from every other creature in order to reflect and represent him. And when the triune God said, let us make man in our image, we note that we were made by the relational God to be in relationship with the divine relationship. And so ultimately, it is all about relationship. Amen. Now, what's interesting is that man alone is not the pinnacle of God's great design. But rather, it is the seventh day or the Sabbath. Because on the Sabbath day, God and man were together in sweet harmony and fellowship. Therefore, this is the zenith of all creation, that God and man are in union and communion with one another. You see, scholars tell us, that on the seventh day, God had something to say. But more than that, he had something to give. And it's the greatest gift that we could ever receive. Namely that of communion with the triune God. And that is why after creating the seventh day, we never read that it ever ends. I mean... After each of the previous days, we read that it was evening and morning, day one. It was evening and morning, day two, and so on and so forth. But we never read it was evening and morning, day seven, because day seven never ends. Because day seven is the whole reason why God created the creation in the first place, namely for us to enjoy his creation, but more than that, to enjoy the creator himself. Now, as well as having a relationship with the God of all creation, the Bible also tells us that we were made to have and be in some kind of relationship with others. Why? Because we were not meant to live or be in isolation. And this has become all the more evident and clear, especially during this time of lockdown. Wouldn't you agree? And so <clears throat> the Lord being fully aware of our predicament of loneliness for the first time states it is not good. And this stands in stark contrast to what the Lord had said before. You see, up until this point, God has only ever said it was good. But now he is saying it is not good. And more specifically, it is not good for man to be alone. And so in one of the most tender speeches in the Bible, we hear the Lord say, I will make him a helper fit for him. Genesis 2, 18. But then immediately after in verse 19, we are told that God forms every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brings them to man. Now, is God playing games? No. Then how on earth is an animal a suitable helper? You may ask, well, it's in the sense of how our pets are able to alleviate some of the loneliness that we may feel from time to time. I mean, if you've ever had a pet, then you will know 
that after a while, how our pets, they become a part of the family and a part of the furniture, don't they? Now, Lord willing, I am hoping to get a dog in the near future um, if I can, because they really are a, a man's best friend. However, as great as dogs are, they are still not a suitable helper. Because a suitable helper must be both like the man and yet different to him. Because as Karl Barth put it, he said, if the helper is only like Adam, loneliness will not be alleviated because Adam will only see himself. And if the helper is different, then they won't belong to him. Therefore, God creates woman. Because she is both like the man and yet different to him. Now, despite the widespread confusion, the Bible only ever recognises two genders, male and female. Because right down to a very cellular level, we either have male or female stamped upon each one of us. And a few years ago, geneticists in Israel discovered that there are 6,500 differences between men and women. That 6,500 genes are biased towards one sex or the other. For instance, the way that men and women store fat and build muscle is different the way men and women produce milk or not, or retain hair or not, is also different. Now, don't get me wrong. My heart breaks for those who seem to be confused in this area. But we cannot deny or gloss over the truth. Because it's only when we hear the truth and come to the truth and know the truth that we are set free. Because when God made us, he never made a mistake because we were made in Imago Dei, in his wonderful image. Amen. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 1, 27. Now here, we see a play on words because the Hebrew word for male is ish and the Hebrew word for female is isha. And so ish is incomplete without isha. Thus, Adam is not fully human until Eve is created. Therefore, both male and female are needed to fully complete the picture and reflect the true image of God. Amen. Now, coming back to the word helper, it is the Hebrew term Aza. And we see this term played out in a number of names like Eliezer, which means God is my great helper, because God really is our great help. Amen. However, here in Genesis 2, we see this term used of woman. Now, ladies, you are going to love this, because Aza, it means the one who comes to the aid of someone in need. And Ken Bailey a professor of theology who studied and taught um, theology and biblical studies in the Middle East, he said that the word Aza, it doesn't refer to a lowly assistant to the boss, no, but rather it refers to a powerful figure that comes alongside to help or save someone who cannot manage alone. Bailey continues, Women are placed by God on the human scene as the strong who come to aid the weak. In other words, us blokes cannot make it alone without our female counterparts. And I'm sure all the ladies will write about now type. Amen. 
And so God wanting to provide a helper suitable for man, put Adam to sleep and from his rib fashioned woman. And as Matthew Henry observes, woman is not made from Adam's head to top him, neither from his feet to be trampled upon but from his side to be his equal, under his arm to be protected and near his heart to be loved. Isn't that good? And when God presented the woman to man, as one preacher put it, man couldn't contain himself but blurted out, whoa, man, hence woman became her name. And when a man and a woman come together before God in holy matrimony, it is then that both male and female together display and reflect the fullness of Imago Dei, his image. Praise God. Now, Becky and I, just recently have had the wonderful privilege of leading a number of couples through a marriage course. And we absolutely loved journeying with these guys. And we discovered that there are no silver bullets or magic wands, but marriage takes work. And as we persist, we see God's good Design that marriage isn't something we endure, but it's something that we are to enjoy. Amen. You see, oftentimes when couples are planning their big day, they work hard to ensure that the church is booked, that their dress is paid for, and that the honeymoon is in hand, and much more. And all of those things are necessary and good. But if they're not careful, then they may be so fixated on the wedding day that they fail to see that it's actually about the marriage itself. Now, I mention all that to say that just like a vine needs to be pruned and attended to, likewise, our marriages also need to be pruned in order to get rid of that dead weight of complacency. And so just like our phones need a software update every so often, likewise, our marriages also need an update and an upgrade. And so I can highly recommend the marriage course that we run. But don't take my word for it. But have a listen to some of the couples that we journeyed with. Have a watch. One of the things that we have enjoyed about the marriage course, I think there's two things that come to mind. One is actually doing it with other Christian couples in the church, which has been really, really nice, but it's been done in a way that you don't air any dirty laundry in public because um, there are many, many opportunities just to go off, um, turn off the camera and uh, have conversations on your own, which is brilliant. And I think the second thing, which has been really, really good is the way Nikki and Sila Lee have done the course. I mean, even though it's based on Christian principles, I'd be really, really happy to invite a non-Christian friend to it. It's, it's such a great format and it creates a platform for that open conversation um, so that you it, it sort of facilitates that sometimes difficult and easy conversation but uh, it's, it's, it's a really good great course yeah it's also nice that you're actually working through it yourself uh, but be guided by people that facilitate the course so it's not like a, you know um, you don't actually have to um, talk about it on on the on in front of other people so you know you don't you don't feel like you're being judged or anything like that you it is quite a nice and relaxed atmosphere um, also um, you know, you're doing it every week, so you're meeting other couples on Zoom, uh, which is quite nice to catch up with people, yeah, especially yeah. now if you, you know, when you don't see them at all. It has uh, taught me that actually sexual communication with your partner, uh, that we shouldn't take it for granted, and that it is really important to communicate with your partner, even on the smallest of details. 
Um, I really enjoy the course because it's it's filled with great content. Um, I've also learned that even when you think your marriage is great, there's still lots of ways you can make it better. Um, it's been a fantastic opportunity for us just to talk to each other about things. We've covered almost every area of our marriage off in a structured way. It's just been a really useful way to make sure that we talk about all the important things that we uh, should be dealing with, especially the things that perhaps we haven't talked about for quite a while. Yeah, I think I've really enjoyed the making that time to spend together. It's so easy to get caught up in family life and just making that time on a Monday evening to spend together has been really good. Um, and just nice, really. Uh, we've managed to just send the kids upstairs and nothing dreadful has happened. So it's been really good to kind of spend that time together. What we have enjoyed about this course is that it touches every aspect of the couple life. It makes us realize how past experience impact your relationship. Uh, yes, and also having practical advice was very helpful. Tips to uh, deal with our relationship on a daily basis. It's, it's, it's around your, the, your responsibility as a parent. Um, I think it really helps to bring it to life how important it is what you do how that will shape and define your kids future relationship uh, I, I didn't know how important that is but it really helps to dial that up a little bit um, yeah it's really good you, yeah you kind of look into your past isn't it yeah, how yeah. your past is actually affecting our relationship now, now. Yeah. and that makes you realize how important is it that as a parent that yeah. you know making sure that you're giving them that good basis for good relationships um for me i think it's all these um things that i learn about the communication and different ways of communicating uh, uh with 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 my husband and effectively communicate and also the the importance of forgiveness because you know without the forgiveness actually the relationship you know it, it, it tend to have troubles yeah and they kind of uh, pile together isn't it yeah it builds um, up over it time builds up yeah. over time yeah. um mm -hmm. but yeah it was really really good to look into the into depth of the different aspects of relationships isn't it yeah although we've been married for nearly 30 years and we kind of know what we're bad at but the course has reminded us of what we're good at and so that has made us appreciate each other more we're just going to set more time aside really just to spend time together to concentrate on our marriage and spend some time with each other just to avoid making finding ourselves in a situation where chores and life and children and jobs and all that sort of thing just seems to get in the way and we um, don't end up spending time with each other so that's the main thing we're going to do we're just going to dedicate time to spend on our marriage and on each other uh, the one thing we'll take away from the course i think is communication Yes, communication is a key in any relationship because it helps you to express your feeling and understand each other better. Yes, and also expressing our emotion and knowing how it impacts our daily, our daily lives. My key takeaway from this is uh, quality time with your partner. Yeah, I think it's something when you get to a certain stage, you have to take it for granted and I uh, think it is needed to bring back that spark. Um, my key takeaway from the course is the importance of forgiveness. Um, I've learned that if you don't heal um, from past hurts, um, it makes it really difficult to move on in a healthy way. And I would really, well, we both would really recommend it. Um, it's a course for anybody, really, however long you've been married. Um, and we actually did the same course when we first got married and repeating it um, quite a long time after. It's actually really good and really beneficial. And you know that you're in a different place uh, from where you were before. And I think it'll be something that we repeat again in the future. So we would really recommend it if you get the opportunity to, um, to have a go at this course. Uh, we would definitely recommend the course uh, because it's easy to follow and it's, uh, it's a good structure. And it's like having counselling at home. I would recommend this course to any married couple. I think it doesn't matter how long they've been married, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, it gets you to open 
to break down or more like break down barriers which you think are not there but visually they're not there but they're there because there's certain things you can seem to open up to your partner too but this course has kind of helped up with that yeah yeah um i agree with gibson um i highly recommend the course um i think it's great um whether you're going through a rough patch whether you're newly married um i think it helps set a strong firm foundation um for a long lasting marriage yeah. even if it's not just firm foundation it helps you fix what patch holes that you think will be that are that are there that needs to get fixed but you can you personally don't know how to fix them but thank you this course it will teach you and guide you yeah. in ways to fix them yeah. and i would definitely recommend to um oh. you know anyone that doesn't matter what what uh, how long they've been together uh, it's really good to you know progress your relationship and 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 make you feel Happier, isn't it? As a it couple. is. It is. Uh, it is uh, look, Aggie just said, I recommend it to anyone. Then we we still we still learning. It's a journey. We we yeah. know we're near near it yeah, where we need to be. But I'm really enjoying it. Would you recommend this course to other people? Definitely. Now, if you're still wondering what this course is all about, then let me just give you a brief overview. We learned how to strengthen our connection with one another. We learned how to communicate effectively with our spouse. It's a key ingredient. Because unless we are able to have those deep, meaningful conversations and are able to speak about anything and everything, we may struggle when it comes to resolving conflict. And so... In the words of Bob Hoskins from the old BT advert, it's good to talk. Amen. Now, in addition to connection and communication, we also looked at the topic of affair proofing our marriages by having good sex. Yes, you heard me right. Now, some may blush. But unless we realise that sex is God's good design and gift to a man and woman in marriage, then the enemy will continue to pervert it and distort it. Now, the Bible has much to say about sex and is not prudish, but rather it puts sex in its rightful place between a husband and wife and blesses it. And if you want to know just how much, then have a read of the Song of Solomon and you will get the idea. The Hebrew writer concurs and says that marriage is honourable among all and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Hebrews 13, 4. You see... Unless we demonstrate the blessedness of marriage to the next generation and instruct them not to stir up love before its time, but to wait on God, we do them a disservice. And so it is imperative that we cultivate strong and healthy marriages and provide solid examples for others to follow so that the next generation doesn't play with fire and get burned, be it the fire of premarital or extramarital sex known as fornication and adultery and any other sexual perversion for that matter. And so if you're a man and a married man at that, then let us rejoice in the wife of our youth and drink water from our own well and cistern. Proverbs 5. If you are single and marriage is your desire, then look to the Lord and begin to pray for your future spouse. And if you are single and content, then rejoice because you are free to do the Lord's work at will. Amen. Now, if you are kicking yourself right about now because you missed the course, then fret not, because we will be running the course again. So be sure 
to look out for future dates. I tell you, if you are willing to invest your time and your energy into your marriage, then I guarantee you it will pay dividends. Amen. And so to summarize, God made man in his image. Sin wrecked us. But as we come to Christ, our image and our marriage and everything else is restored. Because ultimately, Jesus is the perfect image of the invisible God in every way. And he invites us back into that Sabbath day fellowship and relationship when he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In other words, I will bring you back into that for which you were made, namely to enjoy sweet fellowship with firstly God and then with one another. And as our relationship is restored with the divine relationship, it is then that we begin to reflect the fullness and the completeness of Imago Day in our marriages and in our friendships as well. Amen.